Good morning and thank you very much, uh, Bruce. It's good to be here at Dartmouth, faced with, uh, with a rich history of 250 years. I hope that someone will tell me before I leave uh, how old this university actually is because uh, I've heard different accounts here at the back. Uh, <laughs> that it may have started in 1769 or 1789, but I'm sure Google will help us. Uh, the last time I, I addressed a group so big uh, was shortly after Nelson Mandela was released and we were pelted with tomatoes in a town hall. Um, and that is why uh, I experienced a sense of belonging when I arrived here yesterday and uh, I gave my surname. Uh, I just have to correct uh, Bruce, it's McCarthy with a C, so I think it's more Irish than Scottish. Uh, you may want to go back and figure out what the Brits and the Europeans and the Americans and others did when they discovered gold and diamonds in South Africa in 1866. I think there was a lot of cross-pollination, if I can use that word so early in the morning. Um, and so this, this lady asked me for my last name, I said McCarthy, and she said, what's your father's name? And I said, Joseph. And she, uh, <laughs> she, she gave a consoling smile. Um, and it, it only came to me later, but uh, and I felt better about myself. Um, now, uh, this morning's news, just to put you, put you, put you in the picture, uh, suggests that the trial of uh, Mr. Hosni Mubarak will start. Um, I hope it won't be a, a fiasco or a circus. Uh, uh, secondly, the French, the French, and you know the French, they've decided and authorized the extradition of of General Noriega back to Panama almost, what, 20 years later, and, uh, and an investigating judge, which is not something uh, very common in countries like the United States, has decided to, to uh, recommend that Total, the oil company, be charged with corruption um, arising out of the Iraqi oil for food program. Now, you may very well say, well, these things all are coming 10 years too late, but uh, you know, I'm an optimist, and so when they happen, I say that's progress. And, and one of the points I'm making when I speak to people is I say that the world has done more in the last three years to fight corruption uh, and, 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 and crime, and, and with mixed success than w as opposed to what we may have achieved in the previous ten years. Uh, now, with the debt crisis, um, uh, uh, the, the, the debt ceiling out of the way, and uh, I, I, I've always heard about America's sense of pragmatism and the, the ability to reach an agreement. Uh, um, and, and this time I watched it live and I asked, where is it? But uh, <laughs> with that out of the way, let's talk about, let's talk about uh, corruption, crime, and crooks. Um, I want to, 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 to make the point about... Uh, about learning the hard way uh, as, as one of my, my, my second uh, sub-paragraph of my lecture this morning. In the early 2000s, uh, you know, we were still young and, and vibrant and active and a lot of blue sky thinking and vision in our eyes and we heard about this, this crowd called the FBI and they, uh, they asked us to help move a suspect person that was hiding in Cape Town because they charge him in the United States with uh, the bombing of the U.S. embassies in Kenya and in Tanzania. And we did that. We put him on a plane one Thursday evening, uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, and the courts criticized us. The Constitutional Court said we should have asked the Americans for an undertaking that they won't hang him, because in the United States you hang people. Uh, other countries they don't. And they said bef before uh, we agreed to, to, to move him out of the country, we should have asked the Attorney General here to, to give an undertaking that if they convict him of the crimes uh, uh, that with which he was to be charged, that they won't hang him. I always use my mother as a, as a, a moral compass. And so she read the Sunday Times headlines. And I, I called her. She lives in a small town. I said, Mommy, you shouldn't believe everything you read. And she replied, she's only done standard four, and she said, Lenny, that criticism is okay. 
And uh, it's something that carried me throughout the last 15 years of my life because that criticism by the courts notwithstanding, it was something that had to be done then as part of a larger strategy against the sponsoring of international terrorism. Uh, a few years later, we were busy with an arms procurement investigation. You know, you'll be surprised how much money changes hands in arms deals. And, uh, and one day when I write a book, I might just end up turning all of this into a movie, there was a piece of how a U.S. representative from an arms manufacturer here was walking with uh, two people from uh, government officials um, and other intermediaries discussing the possibility of the U.S. company paying a bribe. And the U.S. representative said, we can't do that. Uh, and they were doing this in Central Park, of all places. A quiet stroll in Central Park. And, uh, and he, his explanation to us later was that he was afraid of being hit by the foreign corrupt practices legislation in the United States, which arises from something called the Nippon Papers case in 1977 for those uh, eminent lawyers in the room. And um, to the credit of the United States, it is the one country that really pursues foreign corrupt um, practices like no one else. I think the second, the second country uh, rating behind them right now is Germany. The rest are adopting legislation, but I think it's something that the world can really tackle in a big way. The third example I want to give under the heading of um, of learning the hard way is that in 2006, actually 2005, on the 20th of December 2005, I was uh, lying on a beach in Cape Town called Fourth Beach, those of you who have visited Cape Town, when I got a call from the senior counsel defending a gentleman called Mark Thatcher, the son of Margaret Thatcher. And he was uh, accused of sponsoring um, a coup in the Equatorial Guinea. And, um, and his lawyer said they wanted to plead guilty to the attempted financing of a coup. And uh, we spoke about pragmatism earlier, uh, and I decided to accept that plea. And uh, he pleaded guilty and, and paid a fine of about five million. Uh, he was given uh, 10 years suspended for 10 on condition that he cooperates with us and give an affidavit that amounts to a full and frank disclosure of the evidence. And, uh, and he also, rather humiliatingly, had to agree to do community service. Now, much of this was psychological because he pleaded guilty out of his own mouth. And sometimes there is no, no better result than someone pleading guilty out of his own mouth. Uh, true to the Americans, they, they then decided the U.S. Uh, Department of State refused to allow him uh, a travel visa following that guilty plea. And when I was asked about it, I, I feigned surprise. But for me, what was important was uh, anticipating what was likely to come. Uh, sometimes a little bit of name and shaming uh, uh, is part of learning the hard way. Uh, in a lecture like this, it's also important to look at a situational analysis, you know, when you dissect the, the DNA of crime, uh, corruption, uh, and criminals. Uh, for me, it is still quite remarkable how the protagonists of organized crime, especially in the areas of drug dealing, money laundering, arms smuggling, and human trafficking, often use similar modus operandi. They use similar payment systems, they use similar um, communication techniques, they use similar distribution routes. And so uh, what's important is that we take heart in the fact that they also often are equally vulnerable to the same investigative methodologies properly executed. And if you go back and talk to authorities that have had success in fighting organized crime, you'll find that there is a convergence of good practice um, that I think we could all benefit from. Even today, the average prosecuting attorney uh, smells a rat when he's confronted with the following words, an advance fee, payment, administration fees, facilitation fees, 
service fees, all of them masquerading as legitimate business expenses. Uh, and I find this at the World Bank, which is a unique place. Uh, recently we had a, a, a case where some intermediary was paid 5 million US dollars uh, up front to help make a deal possible. And what he did was produced a small brochure uh, to the company um, under the banner of this word that I still don't understand called due diligence. And I said to the guys, but this is not five million dollars worth. And I had serious lawyers telling me that this is legitimate. So, uh, you know, under that situational analysis, I think it's important that one uh, holds your guard and not, not allow these, these uh, schemes and, and, and distinctions to get blurred in the process. Uh, the world is, is at a very critical stage right now, and so uh, my own view is that a downward path uh, for oil means a bumpier road for military dictatorships who purport to function as democracies. And you can see it uh, uh, in parts of the Middle East and North Africa. It's resonating already in Eastern Europe. I think it's going to, 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 to trickle off to South America and I suspect it will ultimately affect countries like China. Um, and lurking in the wings today are a combination of major terrorism threats and the paralysis that come with failures in cybersecurity. I was in Europe recently at the same time when Robert Gates, who is a very impressive man, spoke about the threat of cybersecurity. Um, and it's one of the things that I'm advocating at the World Bank that we should take much more serious. Uh, in fact, industry experts don't know whether the next big event is going to be anything but a paralysis arising from a cybersecurity attack. On the money side, and I'm not a stat statistician, I'm sure there are many uh, statisticians in the room. Uh, I, I really get scared when people start saying that the size of corruption is, uh, is so large because I haven't done the the arithmetic, and I like to rely on empirical facts. But they, they pitch illicit financial outflows from developing countries at around $1.4 trillion, and the average direct losses to corruption at about $30 billion, the very least. Uh, against that backdrop, we have noticed, and I'm sure you all read the newspapers, a worrying dereliction of duty by reputable treasuries um, and established banks who blissfully received more than 500 billion US dollars of questionable deposits from the Middle East. Um, we have something called the STAR program which uh, seeks to help countries recover stolen assets. And when I was talking to the Tunisians to get them to talk to the Swiss because Lots of the money lead to Switzerland, and Switzerland, to their credit, when they are in a box, they come out and try to help you. <laughs> and uh, the, the Tunisians said, but Mr. McCarthy, you are a lawyer, aren't you? I said, yes. They said, did you study Latin? I said, a little bit. I managed to get 51%. My father said, you will do Latin because it's important to do Latin. And they, they said, but there is this Latin phrase, res ipsa loquitur, meaning the matter speaks for itself. So I said, what do you mean? I said, but you can't honestly come and ask us to help you and give you assistance um, to recover monies held in banks in Switzerland if the money was in the first instance held under the name of the president. Any, any banker or any treasury with a little bit of common sense. In South Africa, there's a Zulu language. The Zulus use the word ngondo, meaning brains. Anyone with a little bit of common sense will tell you that uh, if a president has five billion in a specific trust fund, then you have to ask where did he get the money from? And so I think we all have a little bit of egg on our faces, but maybe it was, it was important that it came. Uh, all of that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, goes to the issue of uh, what is missing. And in my view, what is missing is, and uh, I hope I'm not insulting anyone and making the lawyers feel to too heavy-headed this morning, but what is missing is an abundance of excellence in trial practice. 
uh, around the world. It is an unfortunate universal fact that uh, the top brains of investigators and lawyers and prosecutors don't always sign up to public service or to international organizations. They go somewhere where they can make money. Uh, authorities here in the United States have been leading on many fronts, and you have to give them credit, but the global impact is a mixed one. Um, people are looking at, 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 at sparks of hope and, 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 uh, and uh, leading lights and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, uh, centers of excellence. Uh, there are not very many, but uh, there are some that give us hope. I went to China in, in, in April and I met the five departments and their ministers who are involved in the fight against corruption. They actually take themselves very serious when they sit and tell you what they do. Uh, they actually believe it too, uh, uh, which, is, which is more dangerous. But, but uh, I came back and I did an analysis of, of the people I met and I said to the president of the World Bank that the hope in China right now is the is the, what is called the Supreme People's Procuratorate. When I walked into that office, I realized I'm dealing with a different crowd. I could speak to them. And so, you know, it's, it's, the lesson really is, is, to, is to, whilst you judge, it's always better to go, go, go to ground and meet people and, and take their pulse and look into their eyes and, 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 and make your own uh, evaluations. Similarly, in, in, in India, where you must follow, there's a big outcry against corruption. And the Prime Minister, who was always uh, seen as a, as, a, as a second Gandhi, is a bit under the, under the whip at the moment. Uh, it's amazing how your people can turn against you in less than 10 years. But the hope in India, again, is the, is the, um, the Central Bureau of Investigations. They are India's version of the FBI. Similarly, in Indonesia, it is the Corruption Eradication Commission. It's called the Komisi Pembarantasan Korupsi. Um, and the great paradox in this is that whilst finance ministries in certain countries show promise, and often the finance ministries and the, the, the central banks of many of these countries are, are light years ahead from other departments, um, if you on the other end, look at the criminal justice systems in countries like the Philippines, Kenya, Bangladesh in particular, Vietnam, Russia and Argentina, to name but a few, um, you would agree that they could do with a serious dose of technical competence. This leads me to, to the issue of culture, because understanding what goes down in a particular country and understanding the culture of crime and corruption and what makes certain societies overcome them is essential to formulating solutions. Um, I went to South Korea in March and I met the Attorney General there and the, the President of South Korea embraces a mantra of clean Korea and uh, they've cleverly managed to take this word pragmatism, modernization and the mystique and discipline that comes with the the, the Eastern uh, Oriental history uh, to make it a winning formulation. And if you look at South Korea, they were coming out of a military dictatorship in 1992. They had a similar GDP as South Africa. They had about 46 million people and they shot straight up. They are now a, a, a contributor to the World Bank's finance. They are amongst top 20 economies. They serve on the, on the uh, you know, they're part of the G20. And, and the Attorney General explained to me what made that possible. And he said one of the three pillars upon which they based the, the, the reversal of South Korea was resilient and strong law enforcement. Um, and he said even his position is a two-year position. I said, why? Can't you tell the President that it takes you six months to get down in your chair and then six months to pack your boxes so you've got a year left to work? He says, no. That's what the people of South Korea decided. This job is so important that no one should be in it for longer than two years. Returning to this issue of culture, in many African countries, uh, and last night someone asked me about this word called Ubuntu, uh, the notion of Ubuntu is often stretched 
to accommodate a dangerous cocktail of brotherhood or sisterhood, one, one level, cost sharing and helping one another, and then what is referred by some of our courts as generally corrupt relationships. Uh, I have to, on a lighter note, say that uh, you know, in my office I try to develop a sort of a, an oath of office, but because of the diversities at the World Bank, we don't want to use the word oath, so we, we're looking for some ethos statement. And in doing that, we did some research about the, the oaths of offices of different countries. Now, I know that Cambodia is, is, a, is a thorn in the flesh of many, of many countries, but uh, on a lighter note, I found this piece uh, uh, that I thought I'll, I'll humor you with this morning. This is the oath of office, oath of prosecutors in Cambodia. Uh, it is excruciatingly funny for, because of what it purports to achieve and, and the many contradictions, but I'm going to read it. It says, if we act in deviation from the law and implement the law um, back, okay, we're going to try. There you are, there you are. Got it, got it. You see, it takes Africans some time to get there, but I am there. Um, uh, it's, it says, if we act in deviation from the law and implement the law incorrectly or with dishonesty, may all angels, f forest spirits, and sacred spirits destroy us. Make us die unattended in deep suffering from the bullets of a gun, from a lightning strike, from being hit by a car or a motorcycle, from a snake or tiger bite, and in the future make us live separated from relatives and parents in poverty and suffering for the next 500 lives. Uh, I wasn't sure. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether they meant 500 lives or 500 years. But I mean, there's there's so many contradictions in there. At one level you're supposed to die. At the other level you're supposed to live separately from your relatives for a long time. And uh, I I still don't understand the distinction between forest spirits and sacred spirits, I'm going to go ask them. But if you are there, you, if you've been to Cambodia, you're going to ask yourself with a country that is probably among the top 40 or, on any decent corruption index, uh, how do they get to making such a statement? I didn't want to put all of this on a slide because I'm not a slide man, but they go further and they say, and I, I'm going to read this piece, they say, if we do good deeds and act honestly in compliance with the law and work hard, may all angels, here it comes again, forest spirits and, <laughs> and sacred spirits bless us with long life, happiness, good health, wealth, precious treasures, prosperity, high ranks, and good friends and relatives, and in future lives help us to be good, wealthy, prosperous, and dignified forever. I don't know whether I want to be a prosecutor in Cambodia. Um, but you know, if you contrast that, uh, that oath's supreme devotion to upholding the law to the euphemisms you are likely to encounter from the corrupt, it's actually quite, quite uh, insightful. Uh, I, I went to the DRC uh, sometime in 2003 when they were fighting. They wanted me to help them set up their own version of the scorpions. Uh, the scorpions, just so that you know, uh, someone asked me last night, why scorpion? And I said, the scorpion is the only, Tom, you must help me, whether it's a reptile, God knows what is the proper designation, that if you pour hot, if you pour, uh, if you put it in a boiling kettle for three days, it won't die. So, so that's why we decided on this name. Uh, it's got nothing to do with the stars. But... Um, so when I was in the DRC, they, they, I heard this, this, this colloquial phrase in Swahili, chimesy, chimesy. So I asked them, what does it mean? They said, no, it means give the old man some tea. <laughs> chai, you know, those of you who, who, who drink this, uh, there, there is a chai tea, my wife tells me. And, I, I, and it makes sense. Chai mzi is... Is, is a common African phrase for uncle, old man. Chimesy, give the old man some tea. And so it's their way of saying, give me something under the table. 
pay a bribe, give me something. Um, you know, and, uh, and in many of our international investigations, we hear company executives alluding to their, their obligation in, in inverted commas to ensure that crumbs fall off the table. They say we have to make sure that there's, we bring sandwiches and that the crumbs fall off the table. They also talk about uh, uh, the need to bring meeting fees. And then they put stuff in envelopes and they say those are meeting fees. And they actually believe that it's quite legitimate, some of them. Or, or uh, I was struck by, by something that happened in the Philippines where, where they, the company executive spoke about the, uh, uh, the importance of bringing flowers. Bringing flowers was, was a euphemism for, for a, a corrupt influence. And so, so if you again look at, at, at what goes around from Asia to Africa, one sporadically hears politicians enthusiastically resort to two phrases when you confront them. Uh, when the books don't balance, they say, no, that's struggle accounting. I don't know whether you've heard this. I mean, this was just, when I first heard the words, let it leave that, that's struggle accounting. I said, okay, struggle accounting. Or what some politicians refer to as slippage. The Minister of Finance once called me, and he said, you're busy with this investigation? I said, yes, Minister. He says, let us just give some consideration to whether this is not just some slippage. I said, thank you, Minister, I, I will do that. And they do this in an attempt to soften the impact uh, of corrupt influence uh, in, as it goes around in their business. It never ceases to amaze me also how governments in captured economies, and I hope that someone in this group will embrace the idea of doing a study about captured states. The World Bank did something uh, some time ago that was not exactly... Uh, uh, you know, something that would make Hollywood, but, but um, we tried. But I, I think it's something that really should be tackled seriously because it could inform the way we relate to those countries, um, the business we do, the assistance we give, the aid we give. Uh, and I mean, I, I'm, I'm personally cynical about ratings and rankings, but I, I think it's an, it's, it's an underutilized, uh, if not a neglected area. But coming back to these captured economies, you often find that governments confidently declare that the blurring between the party and the state is perfectly justified. And they do this uh, when defending uh, how they enrich a kleptocracy. I don't know whether any of you have been to Malaysia, but uh, I met the Minister of Intelligence there in 1999 and he said to me, Leonard, we use the Bumiputra model here. The Bumiputera model. I said, Minister, what's that? He says, no, Bumiputras were people that were uh, left behind in our, in our uh, historic uh, colonial past. And in order to uplift them, we, we, we provided this Bumiputra model whereby, um, whereby they have a stake in government. And that stake in, in government became the stake of the governing party, the ruling party. Uh, and I think that's a dangerous... Uh, a dangerous uh, uh, rainbow uh, strike that you see in many countries uh, around the world. Uh, just three quick examples, and then I'll come to the World Bank. During a conversation I had last year with Prosecutor General from Eastern Europe, uh, I don't know how, whether you have had exposure to the Eastern Europe, but it's a unique setup there. Uh, and they made mention to what they call armed guard interview techniques in some countries in their regions, who, according to the Attorney General um, um, of Romania, was actually quite uh, a normal practice in some countries in that region. Uh, closer to home, and what was for me, uh, 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 you know, very positive is when I started working with what the Americans call resident legal advisors, which were made available by USAID uh, I found it most refreshing when the second one came to me, uh, visited me in South Africa, came back and said, can you write to us and tell us how we can help you? And I thought that was a recipe for success because it, it wasn't some uh, institution or person coming to tell us what's good for us, but asking how can we help you? Um, and when I speak to people who provide assistance, 
is often to acquaint themselves with the local conditions. And so in many countries, uh, in my short spell at the World Bank, I found it's better to lock in authorities, to lock in the governments, and make it untenable for them not to act. Uh, and when you deal with the criminal justice system, is to mobilize accused parties to plead guilty out of their own mouths. Um, I gave this background to illustrate that one can only really succeed if you uh, know who or what you are dealing with um, and what is the going culture. Very briefly, I want to come back to the institution that I work for, the World Bank. Uh, last December, we established what we call a global alliance against corruption. It was quite an ambitious project, but uh, with the support of the president of the World Bank, it paid off in, in, in big ways. We convened 286 senior officials from 184 countries at an unprecedented meeting uh, in Washington, D.C. And what was uh, heartwarming was the fact that uh, 109 of them were actually heads of agencies and they didn't send their lieutenants or some uh, junior level staff that couldn't say or decide anything. And we polled them. Uh, and in that instant poll, the, we didn't give them time to, to, to go and think about it. You sit there with something and the questions come up and you have to vote. And so as they were voting, 41% opined that fraud and corruption was systemic in their country. Uh, eight, only 8% eight regarded, as, as, uh, regarded it as negligible. About a half of them, 53%, were more concerned about fraud corrupt, and corruption in their country today compared to a year ago. Um, members perceive the greatest vulnerabilities to be political corruption, 39%, uh, and misconduct in public procurement, 32%. And here you can think specifically of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and, and Somalia. And I hope you won't ask me any questions about them because my father always said to me that it's also okay to say, I don't know. I really don't have an answer for those three countries. Um, the most significant challenge to the effectiveness of member institutions, according to the group poll, they were political interference, 23%, and insufficient expertise to effectively combat corruption. 21%, a subject that lies very close to my heart. And so based on some of these examples I've already shared, these statistics are not entirely surprising. And for those of us working for institutions like the World Bank, however, it is important that we uh, make sure that we align our anti-corruption work um, with what our partners and people like yourself uh, are actually experiencing on the ground. Just to give you some, uh, an example of the sort of cases we confront, in one of our more serious cases, uh, we conducted an investigation after receiving allegations of fraud and corruption related to a road construction project. Uh, investigators found that a senior project official solicited a bribe for $75,000, approximately 12% of the contract sum, from a multinational firm. Uh, during interviews with our investigators, uh, former members of the firm admitted that the senior project official had solicited the bribe in order to ensure to issue the firm with a work acceptance certificate. Now this is quite ordinary in, 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 in what we confront um, in many of the investigations that we do. The bigger point here is that whilst there cannot be optimal development without infrastructure, interestingly 20% of the World Bank's landing has gone into roads at the same time, we find that 30% of our investigations emanate from the transport and road sector. Uh, this is typically what we have to deal with when we are cleaning up the imperfections of development. Someone has to do it, and that's me. The corruption of basic transactions and processes that we should be able to take for granted uh, will run smoothly. Uh, on a positive note, though, we are making inroads. Uh, since 2008, the World Bank has concluded 580 external and internal investigations of all shades. Uh, we've generated close to 250 combined sanctions applications and debarments to deter wrongdoing and protect public funds. Uh, I often get asked uh, by people whether we are fail-safe and I say no, but I'm happy to defend the institution and say to you it is probably the preeminent or best institution to put your money 
uh, in, and hope that it reaches its intended uh, objective and audience. And so most of our investigative findings in another 150 substantiated cases uh, have been referred to investigating and prosecuting authorities. And that's the reason why we established this alliance, is to help these people uh, to help themselves and take charge of affairs in their own countries. We define integrity results in terms of the deterrent effect of investigations, the delinquent entities interdicted or the extent to which they are interdicted, the impact of preventative precautions. You know, there is this man called Albert Einstein who said that um, intellectuals solve problems. Uh, geniuses prevent them. And so we, we're trying to be like Albert Einstein. We don't always get it right, but we're working at it. And so, um, and so one of the success factors is also the effect of legal actions taken by national authorities. Uh, and we define our progress in terms of the cooperation underpinning uh, the success of investigations, the lowering of governance risk, which is important, and some sense of an international coherence in the anti-corruption arena. And so every now and then you'll see we issue a press statement about Siemens or a company called Macmillan, uh, and we don't, we try and do this in a humble way, which is difficult if you work for a place like the World Bank. There are many World Bankers here who will tell you that we're not known for that humility. I say that tongue in cheek, but it's important that we, we speak to the public. You know, we, 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 you know if, if you don't say certain things, people won't know that you're working. Um, just a final example in 2009, the Bank Group and Siemens, I'm sure. All of you have been touched by Siemens. There must be something of Siemens in your garage, in your fridge, in your lifts. Uh, you know, they're a big player. But they were naughty. They were very naughty. So we agreed, uh, we agreed on a comprehensive settlement uh, following the acknowledgement of past misconduct in its global business and the, uh, and the World Bank investigation into fraud involving Siemens's uh, a subsidiary in Russia called Triple Zero. They defended this quite heavily, but it later made sense to me that Triple Zero was responsible for 25% of their profit. The whole Siemens thing made me remember the Mark Thatcher case I referred to earlier. But I, I managed to go home and sleep uh, in peace. You know, you must always, when you do your work, ask whether you can sleep in peace. I was criticized for it, but that's okay. Uh, the settlement included a two-year voluntary restraint where they were shut out of business. Uh, the, the subsidiary triple zero was debarred for four years and in an unprecedented step we agreed with Siemens that they should commit a hundred million dollars uh, as a payment to support anti-corruption work. I talk about this case all the time because I think it was a, it was a, a tipping point for the World Bank. Uh, you know, it was a definitive moment, a Damascus experience, for want of a better word. Um, because uh, my view is if we can go after Siemens, uh, um, how can any firm doubt that we are serious about fighting corruption, or any entity for that matter? And if we're going after Siemens, why can't other international financial institutions and other national authorities really punch above their weight go for the upper echelons of organized crime and in that way bring them down. Uh, now I am also here as a guest of uh, Iliad and I've been told to break my lecture in two. Uh, my father was a, uh, an Anglican uh, preacher and he said most human beings just cannot concentrate for more than 15 minutes. And he always timed his sermons to about 11 and a half minutes. So I'm going to stop at this point and, uh, and leave it at that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, yes, uh, uh, also just about my mother, I was recently asked by a World Bank economist, and I have nothing against economists, uh, now that the World Bank has, has, um, has defined its uh, 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 position on, on, on zero tolerance, uh, uh, against corruption, what percentage of corruption is permissible? This was, <laughs> <laughs> this was quite a senior person. It was a Monday morning. Now, I'm not uh, one of those people who are awake early in the morning. 
I want to come and retire here in, 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 in uh, Hanover because this morning I tried to impress myself. I was up at 6.30 out there on the green running. I ran around the block thrice. And there was only a woman pushing her son in a, in a cot, uh, in a, in a uh, what do you call it, in a stroller, and another woman walking a dog. All these young students that were making a noise last night were fast asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so I will do well here because I'm not a morning person. But anyway, this question by this World Bank economist came to me uh, at about 8.30 on a Monday morning. And I said to her, let me try and illustrate. My mother gets uh, a, a pension of $100 uh, a month <clears throat> in RAND terms. And if 30 dollars of that uh, hundred dollars disappear to ineptitude, slippage, um, uh, fraud, corruption, uh, ineptitude, duplication and the like, then, then that's, that's bad, whether she's black, white, green, yellow. And so I said the problem with this reasoning about what percentage is, because I, I had a discussion once with Paul Volcker about it and he actually was quite uh, uh, lucid when he said, now you say it's 5% and it's 10, it's 15, 20. Next thing, 30% is permissible. I'm going to just pull together a few things that I wanted to share with you about, um, uh, about how to fight and win, because that's very important. Um, when we look at the authorities around the world, we find that, that the the recipe for success is if a country has a, a, a very good comprehensive anti-corruption strategy. Um, and there are countries that have it and others don't. The ones that have it, even if they implement 50% of it, they do well. Especially if it is supported by a rigorous crime threat analysis. And it's not, you don't have to be fancy, you don't have to have ten uh, different doctorates, you just have to sit down and look at the affected industries, look at the world markets, look at the dynamics of humans, commodities, uh, money, uh, minerals, drugs, uh, arms, and vehicles, and you can have a, a quick picture of what to do in a particular country. Um, the third part of that strategy is aggressive investigations. And I, I, I must, uh, you know, really take my hat off for the authorities here in the United States. They generally take no prisoners. They, they, they you, 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 you know, you, uh, any inkling of an, an, an influence of authorities uh, here in the United States are frowned upon. Um, I joke and say there are only four independent authorities in the world. It's the United States, the prosecutor of Italy, because they've been busy with Berlusconi for 12 years. <laughs> uh, and they're still at it. And the guy doing the case is a friend of mine. Uh, he does uh, take serious amount, copious amounts of red wine on some nights. And I said to him, Fabio, why, you go, why don't you leave the guy alone? He says, no, we will spar right till the end. And the point is they won't close down the office because he's targeting uh, the premier. Uh, the third country, you might find this odd, is Israel. They, they, you know, the prosecutors there can bring down a government. Um, I say this tongue-in-cheek, the, the British and the Israelis generally resign too early. You know, just look at uh, what happened with, uh, with uh, Scotland Yard, and if you look at what happens in Israel and Japan. Those three countries, Israel, Japan, and the Brits, resign a little bit too early to my liking. Um, and then the fourth one is South Korea, uh, which I've explained uh, earlier. The fourth part of that strategy should be a tough interdiction uh, uh, component. You know, you just take contraband and you seize it and you make sure people know about it because that's the way you punch a hole uh, into the face of organized crime. I was uh, uh, assigned to the FBI in 2000 and I stayed at Quantico in Virginia and the director at the time, Louis Free, gave me lots of nighttime lectures about how to be successful in this area and he, he was very clear that the interdiction strategy of the FBI was critical. And then 
what we're doing with many authorities, we see that the, the power of subpoena, inspection, search, and seizure, uh, you know, they're, they're, it vacillates in, in, in many countries, and uh, without that, you really can't be effective. You should be able to put people under pressure. The one thing that for me is a little bit of a drawback is uh, to give you a good examples of hard cases that have been prosecuted around the world. I think the world is moving to, we, we don't have all the stamina we should have as prosecutors. Uh, we sometimes go for settlements or sometimes go for civil forfeiture or sometimes go for dispute resolution uh, mechanism or uh, uh, mediation, all these wonderful words. The one way of instilling the public confidence in the criminal justice system is to prosecute the hard cases and ensure that the criminal courts function. I will never forget um, when we came out of apartheid, we started having workshops. We called them the class. We loved workshops. We never had workshops before, you see. It was not allowed under apartheid. So, so we, were all, we looked for us, we were in a workshop. And one day, uh, Mr. Mandela was looking for the Minister of Justice, and I had his telephone. So the cell phone rang, picked up the phone. And he said, the big man, I said, Mr. President? He says, yes, what are you doing, my boy? I said, no, we are having a workshop. <laughs> he says, oh, he says, can you go in there and tell all those people that I say that the emphasis should be on the courts, number one, the courts, number two, the courts, number three. I said, that's it? He said, yes. So I did that, the courts number one, the courts number two, and the courts number three. The, the f last two aspects is, is that one should be, have mechanisms to take the profit out of crime. Countries like New Zealand, Ireland, and good luck to the Irish, started this, the Hong Kong model. They've done excellent work. The United States is obviously big on this at the moment. Uh, but you need the, the metal... The, the, the mechanism and the, the appetite to take the profit out of crime and obviously have the specialists to do that. Um, and all of that should be used, uh, those outcomes to shape the conscience and the public calculation of our communities. It brings me back to good trial work. You know, I, I, there's a, 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 an American writer called Scott Taro. Um, my wife asked me, why do you read such utter junk? why don't you read something more civilized? And I said, no, I like what he writes. Now, he writes about, about how trial work in his latest book uh, opens arteries on both sides. Um, but more seriously, by winning them, particularly when you swim against the tide, uh, it provides hope to generations of people coming after that because they can read about it. Um, of course, there's the investigative technique. I, I love the Brits, you know, I don't know whether any of you are from old England, but they have some uh, institution there called the Serious Fraud Office. And what they do is they, they use production orders, they interview you by appointment, they're very civilized. They, they use a particular set of methodologies that were probably framed in the 19th century um, to deal with uh, domestic white collar frauds. Yet the world is changing around them. Uh, if you look at the monies I referred to earlier, coming from the Middle East, some of it are in accounts in London. I joke, uh, often joke and say that many roads lead to London and New York. And so there's this, a little bit of a disjuncture in that we're using old techniques to deal with a more cynical enemy called organized crime and corruption. And so even if we see money going into a company's account without a witness or a repentant suspect to fill the gaps, investigators invariably strike uh, a blank because it stops with a cash payment, often via the agent or in a payment to a secrecy jurisdiction that makes it difficult to prove uh, corruption in involving a foreign official. Uh, and long established prosecuting authorities around the world are still trying to address overseas corruption using those methodologies. Whereas what they really need is organized crime techniques, such as uh, legal, and I place the emphasis on the word legal electronic intercepts, uh, lawful listening devices, multi agency task forces, and properly authorized undercover and sting operations. 
The next point I'd like to make, drawing on the finer shades of analysis and deduction, is to recommend to you and to experts amongst us here to embrace forensic accounting because it puts your cases out of the reach of fancy propositions by creative opponents, lawyers and the like. And it also saves a lot of money. Uh, so one way of, of, of making sure that the trial practice prevails. Um, so as an aside, one of my staff members suggested that we look at the similarities between insider trading and collusion to draw some insights about how to expose delinquent entities and players. Another opined that we should formulate stronger perjury offenses, which will have a chilling effect on those misrepresenting the truth or lying under oath. Just an anecdote, I went to Switzerland in 2006 and met the uh, Attorney General there and I said, I want to prosecute someone back home for lying under oath in respect of a tax offense. And the Attorney General said to me that in the cantons in Switzerland, uh, misrepresenting a fact under oath in relation to your tax affairs is not a crime. I said, wow. I said, so how can I persuade you? To his credit, he had a great sense of humor, Mr. Rorschach, and he says, well, it now reminds me of another story I heard that when the FBI were targeting the Mafia, the director of the FBI in 1979 came to Switzerland and were confronted with a similar situation and uh, was given the same explanation. And it's only the FBI who could do that. The director at some point started using a couple of expletives, um, basically saying, give me the information. And basically stared him down. And uh, the Swiss uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Mutual Legal Assistance official went back and got the information and gave it to them. Uh, Mr. Rorschacher then promised to do the same to me because I also stared him down. But two weeks later, they fired him. So. <laughs> That one didn't, that one didn't help. Um, I, I referred to this, this, this uh, I used the noun pragmatism earlier, uh, which dictates that one knows where to stop the fight. Uh, the Chief Justice of South Africa, the former Chief Justice Arthur Cheskelson spoke uh, uh, earlier this year in Washington. Uh, I, I like America because you get lifetime achievement awards here. I don't know, don't know what Arthur did, but he got a lifetime achievement award. And so he came to receive it, but he then spoke out of Mandela's mouth about how Mandela said to him that uh, we fought and, uh, and we, we didn't win, and so we're at the point where we have to settle. And so many people think that settlement is an American in invention. If you go back to the notion of settlement, it finds its roots in indigenous systems all over the world. And so uh, the art of a good prosecutor is not to know when to prosecute, but to know when not to prosecute, firstly, and secondly, to know when to settle. Uh, and, and I want to, to argue that uh, that as much as you should know when to settle, you should also know when to fish on the other side of the pond. And, and building on, on alternative mechanisms such as, such as uh, constructive settlements of the type used by the Securities and Exchange Commissions here in the US and the civil forfeiture order uh, recently used by the Brits in the case against Macmillan, I suspect that there's a rich minefield of under-theorized aspects of international law uh, and public interest litigation uh, that can be employed with great returns. Um, and then, last point, my pet hobby is to appeal for an anti-corruption fund, uh, which could be used by countries, by international bodies, and those who look for worthy causes to compensate and uplift societies for the damage that they've suffered as a result of the scourge of crime and corruption. Now, you try this at a place like the World Bank, I was saying to Tom yesterday, you get three responses. The first one makes you think that the people who are opposing you are actually slightly upset that they didn't think about it themselves in the first instance. The second one is they say it'll never work, it's not really our mandate. 
The third one is they say, okay, well, if you want to do it, let's first have a concept note and a working group. You must have, con you must have encountered situations like that, whereas all you need is it's a good idea, let's do it. You know, I, I'm, I'm envisaging a situation where we have four international statesmen and women, grand seniors who oversee this fund. We, when we make settlements, when the serious fraud office and others uh, recover corrupt or tainted monies in relation to projects in countries like Tanzania and the judges say we don't want that money to go back into a black hole, that that money goes into this fund and this fund with eminent people and good fund management, not by Wall Street, that they decide what happens to this money. And, you know, we stand back and uh, I think it's a good idea. Again, I tested it with my standard four qualified mother and she says, Ali, I think it's a good idea. Now, you tried at the World Bank, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have earned my trip down here if I don't mention that. Just, just on future solutions, uh, the International Court does prosecutions of, uh, of you know, major international human rights abuses and genocide, but the head of that court is a gentleman called Moreno Campo. He's an Argentine, and recently he remarked how ill-equipped the world is to deal with international criminal organizations. Uh, and I said to him, an immediate solution is that we launch an integrated effort to identify the top 200 international crime threat targets and syndicates and act against them. He said, what do you mean with act? I said, we, we, we chop their heads off. But now when I think about this, there is a former uh, um, US uh, defense guy in my office, he's now semi-retired, and so when he read this, this, this particular paragraph in my speech, he said to me, he's reminded by an interview they had with Colin Powell before the U.S. went into the Gulf, and they said to him, what's your strategy? And he, Mr. Powell said, apparently, that no, we will, strategy is to go and make an assessment uh, to snuff them out, and kill them. And so, so we, we won't kill them, but we, we, we want to get to, the, we wanna get to the, uh, the top 200 syndicates and deal with them uh, with all deliberate speed. Uh, Complementing our work with national authorities, I, I've started uh, embarking on a global threat assessment in cooperation with the International Court, Interpol, the U.S. Serious Fraud Office. We still want to tie in the FBI, but you know the FBI is a cagey group. Uh, they, they, uh, but now that Robert Mueller's term has been extended, I should go and see him. And the European Anti-Fraud Office and other interested parties, because I think we can only benefit from it uh, if we know what we're dealing with as opposed to flying in the dark. Because what we're trying to do here is to examine the key intersections between corruption risk, organized crime, and money laundering on the one hand, and the institutional vul vulnerability in developing countries on the other. Uh, this would be a critical input to the governance and anti-corruption position that the World Bank will be adopting uh, in many countries in the post-crisis world. I've also recently asked my office to draw out the correlations, Tom, you'd be interested in that, between five key indices, fragile situations, failed states, illegal payments, rule of law, and the corruption perception indices. And I know these things are not uh, exact sciences, they're not perfect, but compare that particular extrapolation with the 40 countries where we have received the highest frequency of misconduct complaints and substantiated cases over the ten, last 10 years. And so one would take a country like Bangladesh and say, oh, Bangladesh is 36th, 37th, 38th, 35th, 34th, 33rd. And that helps people take sound business decisions because you know what you're dealing with. Um, and then finally, the world needs, in my view, a net worth database for prominent uh, public, private, and international civil servants. Um, it should become part of a, a, a six monthly scrutiny under a program such as Hard Talk in the UK or here in the US. We were debating, I said, I, I've always been impressed with Larry King. So uh, Larry King live where we sit and they say now, Mr. McCarthy, you have a house in Bethesda, 
a flat in Cape Town, a car, you owe so much money, you have that little investment there. So tell us how you made your money. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it's all about civic morality, uh, setting an example, and dare I say to make anti-corruption look cool. Because if my son sees that, he says, oh, okay, that's, that's what life is about. Um, for all the hard lessons I've had to learn on the job, the hardest is optimism. I've met more than my fair share of small-time fraudsters and big-time crooks, and I've had my faith in the inherent decency of mankind tested enough times um, to make me question whether such a thing exists. Yesterday I drove with Tom uh, across the, uh, to the other state that you don't always talk about, um, uh, and I saw this car with a personalized number plate of Miata, and below that was a, was a motto uh, that read uh, that you can either die or live freely. <laughs> so, uh, so I think it's possible with that motto to, to be strategic even in optimism and celebrate small victories uh, and then figure out how to turn them into larger ones. Uh, I, I say this uh, humbly, acknowledging that I'm not an intellectual, so I, I, I can't give you all the wonderful answers. I just try and sound clever. But uh, i reminded about, of an event I went to address in Milan, in Italy, where we all had far too much to drink over lunch. And I was the second speaker after the Chief Justice. And I, I felt I did well, and, and then one of the people came up to me and she said to someone else, where is that big policeman from South Africa? <laughs> and, and I said to my, my, wife, my wife, I said, I, I, felt so, I felt so humbled by that statement, that big policeman from South Africa. I'm just a policeman, so even with the World Bank, I'm just the World Bank's policeman, okay? I, I'm, I'm not this great intellectual. Um, let, me, let me close by, by quoting the story of Eugene Vidocq. Uh, who I'm told is considered by many to be the father of modern criminology, uh, credited with introducing undercover work, ballistics, and record keeping into the field. Uh, interestingly enough, Monsieur Vidoc began his career as a crook. Uh, I chose to interpret this as a positive sign for entrepreneurship. Uh, I often talk about the importance in my work of creating a coalition of the right-minded and the willing. And so if, if Monsieur Vodoc can use his prodigious talent for the greater good, it makes us realize uh, what we can achieve because we never know who our strongest allies might be. I hope you live freely. Thank you very much. Um, I think it would be helpful for some people to if you talk a bit about the, the bank uh, and the IMF, a little about the ownership of the bank and the relationship uh, of the uh, bank to the IMF, and more particularly of uh, the IMF's uh, role and work in pursuing corruption as you are doing at the bank. Joy to <laughs> yeah. no, you're deal with that. Oh, I thought this is my hard talk moment. I thought you would give me a couple of questions. It gives you time to breathe. Um, <laughs> Well, I thought about it. Uh, the IMF invests in hotels in New York. <laughs> the World Bank limits itself to the Renaissance Hotel in Washington, D.C., in Connecticut <laughs> Avenue. No, more seriously, you know, I, I have this uh, affinity for cab drivers. Uh, if you come to Washington, there's a, a group called Barwood, Barwood uh, Taxi, and half of them are from, from uh, Ethiopia. And so the other day, uh, one of the old uh, drivers gave me a lift and he said to me, uh, uh, did you guys appoint a new guy? I said, why? He says, yeah, the other one's gone, the one uh, was in trouble in New York. I said, oh. I said, no, 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 that's a different, that's a different institution, that's the IMF. But it, it, on a more serious note, it shows how the two are conflated in the public mind. You know, my mother that I keep on referring to, 
when I took this job, she said to me, Lenny, it sounds like they've got a lot of problems over there. And, um, but more seriously, the IMF helps uh, to rebalance distorted balance of payments of countries. That's why they can bail out uh, Greece. They could probably even bail out old England at some point. Um, and their relationship is with the, with the, uh, the central banks and with the government. And they put a whole host of conditions in place called an austerity plan, which many countries prefer not to take advantage of. I've spoken to a number of presidents who said to me, we don't want to lend from the IMF. We don't want their help because they're putting you through a ringer. They basically take over your, uh, the financial health of your country and you are beholden to them for the next 20 years. But they are necessary. Their, their, their financial crisis has brought them center stage into uh, you know, the world economy and the world financial system. Uh, we work a lot with them uh, just because both these institutions were born uh, in the same year, Tom told me, year in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, interesting history. Uh, Tom said the reason why they came to New Hampshire is because some Englishman had an asthma problem and he didn't want to come to Washington in the heat. He said he either wants to be at the beach or in the mountains. And so these Bretton Woods institutions were born. The World Bank, on the other hand, we tried to to uh, enhance the development of countries and beat back the scope of poverty. Uh, both very noble, separate objectives. We fund projects, we give money to governments, we decide we want to be in that particular sector. We equate and expand the notion of development. Uh, Tom, uh, driving me from the airport yesterday, told me about how the World Bank, uh, under the McNamara era, became involved in health. But before that, many people said, what does health have to do with development? Until McNamara visited one of the African countries and was exposed to something called river blindness. And so right now, I am pushing very hard to say, law enforcement is development. Because if you have a credible criminal justice system where investigators can investigate without fear, favor, or prejudice, uh, prosecutors can prosecute competently, uh, and with, uh, with, uh, you know, with the strategic news and judges can judge, uh, uh, you know, in the way judges should judge and the courts can function, then that gives assurance to business people, outsiders, donors, the country citizens, and nothing gets swept under the carpet. It becomes a way of life. So I hope that, that answers that question to an extent. Uh, does the IMF have a similar kind of office that's pursuing corruption? Unfortunately not. Uh, they have an ethics office and because of the events of the last month, they now obviously looking at their legal framework. They also looking at what they can um, benefit from uh, in as far as their relationship with us are concerned because many of you will know that the World Bank and the IMF uh, together host spring meetings and annual meetings and we that adds to this conflation in the public mind because people see the two institutions together. The ethics office there has also reached out to us and I said we're happy to help them. Uh, uh, they also approached our general counsel uh, who's French uh, and so uh, it, it's not really something that there is such a big issue because they they pass on big chunks of money to countries like Greece and the challenge is really to link that to conditionality, but the answer is no, they, they, haven't, they haven't put this item so uh, central to their, their mission. Uh, the bank uh, traditionally had uh, ombudsmen, and do you, uh, what kind of role do they play? Do you work with that office at all, the bank's ombudsman? Yes, the, the ombudsman is still there. The ombudsman receives uh, all types of complaints, most of it are related to staff issues. Uh, the ombudsman that we have presently used to be the ombudsman for Coca-Cola, and he shared with us the lessons about how Coca-Cola has, through a responsible uh, ombuds office, reduced the number of civil claims brought by employees against the company by up to 80%. Uh, but in the bank, it's obviously a, a, small, a small part of the equation because you have the conflict resolution section, you've got the staff association, you have the tribunals, 
uh, and then you have the ombudsman and we meet with them from time to time and they share they share what they see coming out of the the uh, the input that uh, they get from staff uh, a question really with regard to the process of the uh, bank uh, in terms of selecting contracts corporate fundings and corporation funding and so forth um, how what kind of measures does the bank take in that process of selecting uh, people to work on their projects uh, is a question about the people we select about the selection process pretty well, with regard to the people. concern about corruption yeah favored corporations for yeah example. well it, you know it's a question commonly asked but the bank starts off with a country assistance strategy where we take stock and say all right let's look at kosovo Let's look at what's happening uh, in Kosovo at the moment. Let's use all the business intelligence and put together a country assistance strategy that fits very well under the remit of development effectiveness. And we, 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 we put our risk matrix down and then decide where is the best way to assist this country. Is it in the road sector, in the health sector, is it direct access, is it working with NGOs, is it working with external implementing agencies and, and really where can one put money into a country with the blessing of the government uh, in such a way that we can uh, see that that country develops. Now you will uh, understand that the World Bank receives these contributions from X number of borrowing countries, we then make money on the on the financial market and then we lend at rates that make even a country like China lend from the World Bank. Um, and when we do that, we then say, sometimes say, but it is not a healthy thing to go into chart. Recently we decided not to fund projects in the road sector in Bangladesh. We've had an ongoing fight in Cambodia and in Vietnam. I've personally been to Kenya and to take a position there to say we cannot with a straight face fund projects in arid lands and roads. Let's just keep our portfolio cooking as it is at the moment. Um, two years ago we were faced with a very difficult situation in Jordan in an energy project called Alcatrana and I advise the president that I wouldn't go in there because by, by leaving the bank to go in there I am guilty of a dereliction of duty. Um, similarly the example that I gave earlier of the five million that featured in an in an oil project in Ghana. So these things happen. What we don't do is to, is to trumpet them because we, we, we deal with them as a way of doing business. The downside of that is that many people may very well ask, so aren't you just throwing money into a black hole? But I think what I tried to convey is that we've positioned my office in such a way that it's a due diligence filter and to say, I mean, the president of the bank is at the point that certain projects, unless I say it's okay to go, he won't touch them. Uh, and, and the institution is beginning to understand the importance of that. As far as the projects are concerned, um, we've got about 2,100 projects. There are probably about 40,000 primary contracts. Um, the bank has tripled lending. The disbursements in the last year has been 35 billion. Over, overall, I think our portfolio is about 333 billion. Um, and you know we we've got a staff component of 14,000 at least 4,000 of them are actively involved as, as project officials and they have specific expertise uh, we still find that the major problems we have are in infrastructure energy uh, roads health education and the environment uh, but they are obviously people are recruited on the basis of their expertise some are economists some are roads engineers some are uh, 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 you know, social, social uh, 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 infrastructure experts, some of them are, are health experts, some of them are education experts, but their job is to make a project succeed. You um, earlier just referred to uh, what percent of, of corruption is permissible, um, the so-called slippage areas. Um, the question is um, how you actually and is it difficult to define uh, corruption in terms of a project because you have perhaps a lot of small scale uh, in any of what they refer to as bakshis and then there, there may sort of a sliding scale to major, major bribes. 
Um, is that a problem in terms of defining uh, what you're going to tackle, what's going to be uh, considered corrupt in your terms? Mm -hmm. um, we, I was asked to come and speak at uh, an event hosted by the Heritage Foundation recently, <coughs> and there was someone from the Millennium, the Millennium Corporation, and uh, we were having this debate about the different shades of grey, and uh, the the vice president of the Millennium Corporation argued that that they use a graduated and differentiated approach to situations like this, basically opening opening the door for what I am against, because as well intended as it may be, you are going down a slippery slope where one day you don't know what percentage you say it's okay, it might be 40 percent. So what we do in my office is nothing gets filtered. Every complaint gets evaluated, gets assessed. If it is worthy of our attention, we investigate it to the full might of the law and we act against. Um, the entities, the individuals, and the government officials, and we often suspend lending, and we recover our money, and we withdraw disbursements. Uh, we're now at the point where we even work with authorities to uh, recover stolen money in their projects in their countries. One thing that I'm seriously advocating is for public interest groups to use public interest litigation and civil action to dig up some of this debt, because in many countries, if you don't act, they will just let it lie. Um, but yes, we, we, we try and steer clear from, from words like slippage, but I'm, I'm not a zealot, please don't get me wrong. And so, in cases where you just have poor financial management, uh, sheer incompetence, duplication, uh, and things that you could fix through capacity building, that's something else. But corruption, fraud, and bribes are things that you, if you do this job for long enough, you start smelling it. The um, uh, more specifically uh, question has been raised whether you attribute most corporate corruption to lower level executives or upper executives, uh, does it migrate up or down? Try me again. This is with regard to corporation uh, corruption. Uh, and you've got lower level executives and the upper higher level executives. And the question is um, how do you attribute uh, most uh, to the levels of uh, people working in the corporation mm -hmm. as being corrupt. Mm -hmm. Does it come from the top or the bottom? Yeah. There's a reason why you have CEOs, boards, and, uh, and chairmen, and non-executive directors. Uh, I must give them credit, they're all very clever. Uh, I prosecuted the first big corporate corruption case against howls of protest by the public sector uh, in uh, 1995 and we managed to show that the whole corrupt scheme was cooked in the boardroom. Now that is an absolute rarity. Even here with the investigations done by the US Justice Department, if you t talk to the head of the criminal division, you talk to authorities around the world, you look at the Siemens case we dealt with recently, the Macmillan case, the case against an Italian company called Lotti, all the big cases around the world. It's probably fair to say that in no more than 5% can you show wrongdoing at the top. They invariably have people at mid-level uh, who take the fall for the, for the uh, institution, and very often they blame it on subsidi subsidiaries. There's a particular company whose name I can't mention now because they will sue me, uh, because we are busy talking to one another, who have cleverly in their uh, 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 explanation to us blamed the wrongdoing to their subsidiary in Africa. They're basically saying that their headquarters had no idea what was going on. Uh, it's difficult and I think it requires that we adjust our investigative strategies uh, and, and really sort of shoot at the top, but as I have said in the past, if you shoot at the king, make sure you don't miss. Uh, but I'm also happy with lesser, lesser victories, right? Uh, I'm happy to say, well, we tried to prove murder and we proved tax. I've learned this from the untouchables, and I'm happy with that. <laughs> I, I'm quite happy with yeah. that. Um, in your talk, you talked about the culture and the great variations in cultures uh, in developing countries. Uh, question is, how do you make progress against corruption 
when it is so often deeply ingrained in the culture of these countries? I'm, I'm very glad you're asking that question because, uh, you know, if you go to countries like Kenya, then you, there's some, I, I should actually forward to you, Tom, some, some videos that you can share to amongst a uh, group assembled here about corruption in Kenya and the other countries too, Philippines, uh, India, uh, Indonesia and the like. Where you come back to Washington and you sit there on the 11th floor of G Street and you realize that by preaching, sermonizing, espousing wisdoms here from high places, investigating a few cases, chopping a few heads off, suspending a few companies, prosecuting a few individuals, uh, etc., that you probably can only be 30% effective. That is why we are very strong on prevention. We've, we've uh, established in my office a preventative services unit that goes right to the ground to help do anticipatory audits, sample uh, uh, forensic audits, work with projects, uh, and work with uh, country officials and work with project officials to try and build precautions into those projects to make them fail safe. You never get it 100% right. That will only bring you another 30%. So the remaining 40 or 50%, if you ask me, lies in exactly this question about the psyche of the nation, the DNA of the people in that country. You know, how do you ensure that my son does not go back to South Africa and vote for someone to be the president, well knowing that if you read who the person is, that this person shouldn't be a president? Uh, or you go to Kenya and you get those people to say, but the current leadership is not the leadership that I embrace. Um, and I was interviewed by the Observer in London recently, uh, and I said I'd like to do two things. And, well, it was a long interview, but you know, the Brits have an uncanny ability to cut through nonsense and just get to the, the essence. And she, the headline was that I, I, I express myself to be in favor of developing a curriculum, an anti-corruption curriculum. And secondly, I said I want to uh, develop and write a big manual that we could use both to educate the enforcement authorities but also the general public. And thirdly, I said I wanted us to make a movie. You know, the Canadians tell me that when they see these wonderful uh, movies here about the U.S. justice system, the chief of the Royal, what, the Royal Mount Canadian Police, his deputy at least, came to Washington last year. He said to me, our oh, people are scared of the Americans. I said, oh, yeah, he says, because these TV programs help. And when Lanny Brewer and I spoke, he said, no, we must make a movie, and he wants Forrest Whitaker to play me. I said, <laughs> okay, we'll do that. But seriously, I'd like us to make a movie. I'd like us to make a, a, a serious movie that appeals, you know, something, not just a documentary, you know, these kids switch those things off. Last night I went to uh, Tom's house and his daughter there has, uh, has uh, put a feather in her hair. I want to go back and put a feather in my wife's hair as well. But, you know, they, that's how this, the, the youth, uh, you know, they, what, what is okay and cool today changes tomorrow. So we need to get right down into the ground, get to the hearts and minds of, of young people. 53% uh, of the world's population is younger than 24. Uh, and so we need, that's, how, that's our only hope of addressing that other 50%. Um, another question. Could you comment on the recent decision of the multilateral development banks to forge an agreement to tighten sanctions on corrupt firms? Yes. Well, uh, when I came to the World Bank in July 2008, I found these multilateral development banks, each one on a frolic of his or her own. And I spoke to the president, I wrote to him on the 3rd of October, and then I went to see Mr. Volker in New York, and I said, I'd like you guys to help me drive this thing. I wanted to establish a, a joint sanctions board as a primary objective, and if that one fails, to push for something called cross debarment. Uh, and we ultimately signed the agreement last uh, April on the 13th 
where all the multilateral development banks now recognize one another's debarments. And so it means there's no place to hide. You know, clever companies just reinvent themselves. They adopt a new alter ego. They make their wives and their children the chairman and the CEO of the company and go and do business in, in uh, Nepal. And you won't know that that's the same company that got debarred by the World Bank. But by doing what we've done, we have basically sent a message to say, that if you steal from one, you steal from all. An insult to the World Bank is an insult to the European Reconstruction Development Bank and the four others. Uh, we have, up until the time of my departure, crossed the bar amongst ourselves about 40 uh, entities in a very short space of time. And the message is going out. Companies now know that uh, if you are fingered in misconduct at the World Bank, you're going to be debarred by the Asian Development Bank, and I think it has a massive deterrent effect. One of the uh, uh, elite members has had a long career in foreign aid, USA, USAID and OECD. Uh, his experience is, in conclusion, is that developing countries, their leaders prefer to steal from their own funds rather than try to do so from the aid funds. It is easier to do. Foreign aid agencies have many controls that national agencies do not have. Do you agree? Is that the experience of the bank? Yeah, that's unfortunately correct. Um, that's why this study that I have, uh, that I have uh, maybe not seriously enough punted is so important. That one starts looking at, at countries that have elements of of, uh, of capturism, for want of a better word. Captured economies, tribal capture, political capture, uh, capture of the, of the essence and instruments of the state. Um, uh, I mean, there are certain countries that, according to Moreno or Campo, are actually captured and run by gangsters. So you have cartels who are in government. Uh, Ocampo predicts that in the next 10 years, we will have a few countries where the, the, the criminal cartels and syndicates are in charge of the government at a variety of levels. And I think the biggest, the biggest drawback of, of human beings is that we are notoriously bad at predicting risk. We see something in developing right in front of us, but we think it will be okay. And I do think if one could, if one could um, uh, do a decent analysis of, of state capture, you could really start putting the spotlight on leaders. Uh, I said last night over dinner that in the last five years, 17 heads of state were prosecuted, some of them for political reasons. Interesting that eight of them uh, uh, reside in the Latin American region. Uh, but I think it's important that one asks, what does presidentialism mean? Uh, you know, you look at certain countries where there are exposures of fraud and corruption against ministers and other officials, but the head of state doesn't act. And then you ask, no one asks, why doesn't he act? He probably doesn't act because he gave the instruction in the first instance. So, um, yes, I agree with, I agree with the, 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 uh, the, 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 the proposition. Uh, and one of the things I think will help is if one has this healthy, open debate, uh, based on lifestyle audits and, and, and uh, you know, what I called earlier net worth database, where you ask, so how did you make your money? Mr. Gaddafi, how is it that you have put uh, five billion uh, dollars in an account in Switzerland and then withdrew it when they started fighting with your son and what did you do with the money? Stuff like that. Uh, when the bank discovers corruption in one of their projects, is it able to recoup its losses? Uh, do you recover the losses from the payer or the payee? Yeah, we, we, the, the business model of the World Bank is we try not to lose money. Uh, <laughs> we try very hard not to lose money. I recent, when I just came back here, we, we got a tip off from a bank in New York that 25 million US dollars were lying there in an account uh, that was paid uh, following a loan by the Somalian government. Now, we don't lend to them anymore, but this is before they imploded in 1982. So I said, we'll take the money back. Uh, and of course, again, there was a working group, concept note, lawyers up and down, but in the end, we took the money back. 
Um, but yes, we, we, as I said, we suspend disbursement, we recover the, the we, we stop the unpaid portion, we, we recover what is, what is uh, due to us by the government if we suspend, and we, we build our, we, we, we take air cover, we, we design our loan conditions in such a skewed way, uh, so attractive at one end, but uh, very much protective of the World Bank so that one could possibly say that we, we never really lose money. The downside though is, and I'm sure the, 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 you know, the great intellectuals say, what about social cost? And I do think we need to work on recovery of social cost. And that's why I'm very, very keen on, on, on civil and criminal asset recovery in the countries. Uh, cost to company. We have in, in my office, INT, an advisory board and the advisory board are four eminent international people and they are now advocating very strongly that we should be able to recover the cost of an investigation when we deal with fraud and corruption. The, um, the series of questions with regard to the World Bank's authority uh, in investigating wrongdoing, for example, you mentioned Siemens uh, or Macmillan's been mentioned. Uh, why do these uh, uh, groups cooperate and how extensive is your authority? Can you question bookkeepers and so forth? Uh, in other words, uh, how does the bank try uh, these challenges or cases of corruption? Uh, international, national courts, how are they prosecuted? Just generally explain the jurisdiction of the World Bank with regard to international corruption, uh, whether it's limited to the countries. Uh, that receive loans from the bank uh, and specifically to projects funded by the bank or in some cases does it um, more generally treated? Yes, the only area where we conceivably stray outside of our mandate is with the STAR initiative which is about helping countries to recover stolen assets that have been plundered by the state. The example that you gave earlier of the gentleman who worked with the OECD who said that People, they steal more from their own countries than what they steal from international funds, which is correct. So we help the authorities that when Mr. X, who presided for X number of years in, so, in Tunisia as president, leaves and, and leaves, uh, with a, a, uh, leaves his books unbalanced, that the authorities there can recover that money, which often has nothing to do with World Bank funds. That's the only instance. All the other instances are based on investigations by my office um, in relation to World Bank projects in countries around the world. Now, what you'll find interesting is that money flows from uh, the developed world and multinational companies to developing countries and then flows back into offshore destinations as investment. We see this pattern all the time. And so our job is to at one level, um, box in government officials and, and, and really interdict the wrongdoing and get those officials out of those projects. The challenge is to get the government to prosecute themselves. And let me be uh, frank about that. Our success rate there is probably about 50%. Um, when I came, the success rate was probably 10%. And with the support of the president of the bank, I started saying, well, if there is a pattern of wrongdoing in a particular country like Bangladesh, and, as, and there is a serial inaction by the authorities, at what point do we say, we don't lend there anymore? I think the same applies to government like the United States. At what point do they say, we are not putting any more money in Afghanistan or in Pakistan or wherever? So uh, it's, it's a critical point and, you know, because we're all bleeding hearts and, and we don't like those unpopular decisions, we try to run away from it. And so the hallmark of a good institution and good officials is the ability to say no. Um, and uh, and that, is, that is always a challenge, is to say, no, we, are, we, don't, we really don't have to do this. And you know, we working with Robert Zillig, I, I really admire this about him. He's, he's often the one clear voice saying, but we don't have to do. We, we are not under obligation to fund that project, especially if we see all these problems in that particular project. Our jurisdiction arises from the, the loan conditions. 
and we have asserted for ourselves uh, audit rights. And so we can audit, seize, inspect any document, electronic uh, uh, or hard copies, and interview people who work on those particular documents. The challenge is often to see how you can push the envelope and, and, and do as much as you can, because we don't have the powers of search and electronic surveillance that national authorities have. And that's why I established this alliance I referred to earlier, because it's like playing any sports. Someone makes a break, goes through a gap, and hands off the pass. So what we're trying to do is to hand off the pass to the British authorities to prosecute Macmillan. What we did on our side is we also prosecuted them before our sanctions board. We, the sanctions board debarred them for six years. Um, and we did the same with Siemens and the same with Lotti. And then you're looking at the Italians, the Indonesians, the Brits, and the Germans to prosecute them. Uh, someone wants to know if uh, any of these uh, people who were responsible for criminal acts, whether in fact uh, they actually uh, made it to jail. And for, if so, for how long? Yes, yes. There are um, 12 cases where people have been imprisoned. The latest one was last week, which I was very pleased about, a company called Norconsult in Norway. This was just before the shooting incident. And I issued a press release praising the Norwegians two days before that madman started shooting down people there, um, where they convicted uh, uh, three officials and uh, the ringleader was sent to jail also arising from a World Bank referral. Uh, and again, as I said, I'm not a zealot. What I'd like to see is that if there's credible evidence that we place at the disposal of a national prosecuting authority in a particular country, that they look at it dispassionately, that they look at their legal system, that they apply their minds, and that they decide whether there's a case to be prosecuted, and that they prosecute the case and take it through their courts and let the courts rule. The bank uh, has recently made great efforts for information sharing. And the question is uh, whether the bank uh, has a website now that discloses uh, a summary of its combined sanctions and referrals to law enforcement authorities. Um, and I guess more specifically to you, uh, which of the many successful investigations do you find the most satisfying? Earlier you mentioned Siemens. Yeah, the, the, the idea is to absolutely to link sanctions, referrals, and action by national authorities into one seamless, uh, 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 you know, into one seamless equation. Because uh, we can, what I discovered when I came here is that the bank would do say eleven investigations a year and then debar three companies, and then we all go home and have a beer and say all hail to development. So I came and I said, no, 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 we, we take ourselves serious and we build the office up to, uh, we're just now over more than 100, at least in, in Washington, and we have some capacity and some connections in, in, in the 187 countries that are members of the World Bank. But because of that membership and because of all these wonderful agreements we signed in the United Nations, there are reciprocal duties in and amongst them. And we saw that space and, and, and in a sort of a gap in the international arena, and we walked in there and created this alliance to get all these authorities uh, in the same room where they can talk to one another so that they can, they can take those referrals and do their own investigations uh, and prosecute um, uh, both the company um, you know, and the individuals uh, uh, in their countries, particularly their government officials. And there the action has not been, has not been very strong. You'll remember that I, I said earlier that, um, you know, for us that is uh, one of the main objectives. I get asked a lot by the, by the uh, Senate Judiciary Committees, including the people who had to deal with the debt ceiling recently, to come and account for the action taken uh, by countries on these referrals. As far as the level of satisfaction is concerned, it's very difficult to, to uh, highlight and, and, and identify a particular case. I, th I mean, if you wake me at four in the morning, the Siemens case for me is, is really a massive case. I personally devoted a lot of time and energy uh, into it. And I, I still, you know, you t 
meet with lawyers and opinion makers and media people, it's a big controversial issue. Some say I did the right thing, others say no, you should have hanged, you should really have hanged them and go, you should have gone after them more, more vigorously and, uh, and I said well we might have lost. What they don't know, and I'll say this in this room, assuming that uh, the Chatham House rules apply and it'll stay here, what I do know is if I had to defend Siemens five years from now with the facts at our disposal, I may very well have got them off. And so that's why pragmatism prevailed, and I said, well, let's go with what we can do and what we can show. Uh, at, a, at a second level, I, I feel very uh, strong about cases where you have serial wrongdoing. There's a company here in the UK, in the US, called Glowcoms, and they were all over the World Bank's portfolio doing simple things like bid security frauds, misrepresenting their credentials. They were basically a mailbox company uh, that insourced all sorts of services and did proposals in the world. No one checked it out. And there were about 53 complaints against them. So when we ultimately sanctioned them and the U.S. authorities prosecuted the three representatives of the company, that um, sounded like success to me. The third level is obviously, <coughs> you know, many people say these small cases shouldn't really uh, take up your time. Sometimes the small cases are the cases that send a message. This question which uh, basically um, talks to the enormous challenge that you and your office have and it says what if anything can be accomplished to begin modifying the massive corruption in a country like Zimbabwe? You know, uh, Zimbabwe is one of the uh, saddest cases of this era. It's just a little bit north of us. Um, and there was a time when judges in sub-Saharan Africa referred to Zimbabwean case law as authority. Uh, Chief Justice Gobai was such an impressive fellow and he developed the precedence uh, and the jurisprudence in that country that they just tore to pieces. And the biggest tragedy for me about countries like Zimbabwe, including South Africa, is uh, that people like Chief Justice Gobai and Arthur Cheskelson are sitting at home uh, twiddling their toes. You know, there's no, the country doesn't see what you can do with a retired Chief Justice. Um, I think with Zimbabwe, you know, the, the, the next six months before Christmas will be, will be crucial. Um, I, 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 my, my worry at one level, if I talk to people who know the country, is that the Honorable Robert has reinvented himself. Uh, at a lower level, there are people in ZANU-PF that are probably more radical than what he is. But at the same time, within ZANU-PF, there's now a new, a new uh, a, a new emerging leadership, including the, the governor of the central bank, who came to the World Bank recently, and you should have heard him speak. Um, there's still friction. Uh, uh, I, I, I wasn't satisfied that the MDM has really come to the best possible position. Um, but, you know, it's like Haiti. I think that, that's why the, the, the study that I have mentioned, I think, would be good because it will for once force all of us to take honest and informed decisions about the 40 high-risk countries in the world and Zimbabwe will be one of them. Uh, can you describe uh, the Chad oil pipeline case? I'm sorry? The Chad oil pipeline case where extraordinary mechanisms were put in place to minimize corruption yet the measures failed and the bank suspended or canceled its loan? Yeah. I don't know enough about this case except uh, to say that this happily happened before I came and, um, and we, we suspended the landing. Uh, I really just don't have all the facts. Um, question about the World Bank funding the manufacturing base of weapons in Brazil which were then traded to near eastern countries. How does one decide what projects the World Bank funds 
What about the ethical considerations? Do yes, you, again, it's, it's a case that I, I don't have the facts yeah. of. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I think the tenor of my address here today is that one should take informed decisions, don't run away from controversy, uh, answer the question about whether development outweighs ethical and governance considerations, and how do you justify that? Um, and I, I think, you know, if we have to look critically at the bank, uh, maybe in the last, well, I'd say the seven years before 2008, there was, there, there was uh, a, a more, a greater flexibility in, in, in sort of softening, uh, 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 you know, and, and, and sort of uh, um, uh, uh, being, be more flexible about things like that and, 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 and not really focusing uh, uh, you know, and put the spotlight on things like that. But I, I think the, 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 the business model that we've, uh, we've developed and that we are using at the moment um, is such that we can answer questions like that. Um, just to, this is more a comment than a question. Uh, you talked about the corruption in the transport sector, particularly road building, uh, and the comment is that shouldn't surprise uh, Americans. We have a system called pay to play where political contributions to state officials result in the contracts of road building. Yes, it's a, it's like, a, it's a big thing. I, I should actually send the study to you that we did on, we did a, we did a study on the road sector. And uh, one of the people who were critical in the study is a, a gentleman from New York uh, whose father was in the, uh, in the construction industry. And he, he, he uh, tongue-in-cheek says that, that uh, Corruption in the road sector was started in New Jersey. And I said, okay, Jeff, we'll take that one. We'll take that one under the heading of development. The, um, then, uh, towards the end here, can you give us any specific um, things that we can do uh, in terms of, of addressing uh, worldwide corruption? Uh, what, what can us uh, in this room and our friends and family uh, do to try to address these problems that you've been talking about, if anything? Yeah, it's a very, very profound question. Um, before I left South Africa, I used to give money to a, an AIDS orphanage. I don't know how it happened, but at the church where I used to go, I somehow ended up in the outreach committee. My wife said, how did you ever get in there? And, uh, and so, you know, when you, when you are sort of um, overwhelmed by this goodwill, you then do strange things. And once I started making financial contributions, I never really managed to withdraw from it. And then I joined this wonderful place called the World Bank, where my uh, my adoption uh, 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 outreach um, goodwill has now sort of grown to about five projects. I can tell you that you sleep better at night. So uh, I would really encourage you to look at a worthy project, uh, and there are loads of them around the world, and sometimes it's just the small contributions that matter. Uh, that's obviously at a very mundane level. Secondly, for people who have the appetite and the enthusiasm for this, the useful uh, the, the, and much needed research that could be done flowing from Iliad and, and in conjunction with places like the World Bank and other think tanks are absolutely essential. Uh, and the one thing that I really think is critical is to help to develop legal capacity in many of these countries. If once we have developed this, this good practice uh, manual or handbook, one could then actually go through a checklist and see, but this country lacks uh, eight out of these 25 prerequisites. And so how can we help them? I met with the Prime Minister of Croatia, uh, the President and Prime Minister of Croatia last year, and I said to him, Mr. Prime Minister, you want to accede to the European Union, which is not a uh, naughty badge at the moment, but they feel it was important. Um, so I said, what I propose we do with you is we invite 20 experts around the world and we sit here in your country for a week and we talk about what that means.